Good evening, you guys. Boy, it seems like it's been an awful long time since I've seen some of you. Um, I kind of wanted to go into just real briefly what I'd been up to, but um, if you run into me or if we have a chance to talk, I'll let you know. But um, the most important thing is in Psalms 122, David says, I was glad when they said, let us go up to the house of the Lord. And uh, real briefly, in the time I was away, um, I was able to find a couple different churches to stop into. And uh, it was in the big city, so of course I didn't know anybody. But it, wherever I was able to stop into, I was glad to be there. And uh, it's a real thing to be able to be in, in the presence of the Lord, uh, really no matter where you are. And... Uh, so I'm thankful to be here tonight. Um, I'm just reminded uh, of this place is, is what a great place to, to come and fellowship and worship and learn uh, learn what the Bible learn has to say and what the Lord has to tell us even today in the circumstances each of us are dealing with. So um, I hope you're excited like I am and Kara is. I hope you're glad to be here and if you're not, um, you know what? The Lord has a word just directly for you, too. So um, don't check out with your brain. Don't leave it at the door as you come in. But, but um, just uh, rest in the fact that this is the, a place where the Lord could meet us and minister to us, and, and uh, we can praise and give him worship. So let's do that together. Let's stand up, if you like. Flashes of lightning, rows of thunder. Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was. With all creation I sing praise to the King. 
filled with wonder, all of struck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O oh Great is thy faithfulness. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never Steadfast love, your steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faith. Oh, Lord, great is thy faithfulness. And Lord, we just uh, want to say that you are faithful um, in so many things. And uh, I just thank you that, that in my life I can look back at those times where, where Lord, you were faithful. You kept your promise. Um, you were always true and right. And Lord, uh, we have so much to look forward to outside of, of what this world has to offer. And uh, I just thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, your scriptures um, are also uh, the same way. Uh, the things that you say and have written down uh, so many years ago, uh, those things are still true today. So Lord, as, as we hear from Pastor Jeremy tonight, and Lord, as we hear from your Holy Spirit, I just pray that, that those things that were written down so many years ago, Lord, would be just burning our hearts and help us to, to walk out this life, the rest of this life, Lord, uh, with courage and encouragement and hope um, and hope that can be, uh, Lord, passed on to others. 
So we thank you and love you. We pray that you bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, good evening. Good to see you guys. You can grab your Bibles. I hope you have them. You can open them up to Job chapter 38. That's where we'll be picking up our text for tonight. And man, we're closing in. We're closing in on the end of Job. We're almost through all 42 chapters. And you know, when we started out with Job, boy, we, we saw Job's dilemma. Uh, Job chapter 1, Job's dilemma. We saw that, that Job... This, uh, this man from the land of Uz, he was a, a godly man. Job was a, a wealthy man. Job was a healthy man, and, and Job had everything going for him. He was a, a dad, and he was honored in his community. But we saw Job's dilemma there in chapter 1, and that is Job had everything stripped away from him. And I mean everything. His livestock was stolen, his servants were murdered, his children were killed, his wife really uh, left him, and uh, his health was taken away, and he ended up just uh, on an ash heap uh, with his head shaved and his clothes torn, uh, wondering what happened to him. And, you know, we don't know, uh, or pardon me, we do know what happened to Job. Job didn't know what happened to Job. Uh, Job's friends didn't know what happened to Job, uh, but we, as we read through Job's dilemma, we got a behind-the-scenes look at what was going on in Job's life, and we saw Satan before the throne of God, and you say, wait a second, what is Satan doing before God's throne? He has no business there. Well, here's the thing, is Satan is a created being. That's one of the first things we learned as we opened up the book of Job, it is that Satan is not like on the, the same level but opposite of God. Uh, Satan is a created being. God created him, and therefore he has to answer to God. And we see Satan coming before the throne of God, giving an account for what he's been up to. And when God says, Satan, what have you been up to? Satan says, well, I've been going to and fro throughout all the earth. Basically, Satan was saying, I've been having my way with mankind, doing whatever I want. And God says to, jo or to, to Satan, well, have you considered my servant Job? I think that there might be one cookie that won't crumble. I think there's one nut that you won't be able to crack. And Satan said to God, boy, if you take everything away from him, he'll curse, your, curse you to your face. And God gave Satan permission to kind of have his way with Job. Now, this wasn't to, to take Job out. This wasn't because God wanted to put a target on Job's back. Remember that, that Job was God's starting quarterback. Job was God's star player. And God was using Job to silence Satan. What an honor. What a crazy thing. And in the end, we will see that Job is indeed blessed. God knew all along that Job could handle this. Because 1 Corinthians 10, 13 tells us that God will never test us above that which we are able to handle. Never. Period. God knew Job's frame. He knew the outcome. And so we see this this testing, this situation that's taking place. And uh, we know what's going on again because we got the behind the scenes look. But Job and his friends, they didn't. And so we move in chapter one from Job's dilemma where he lost everything. And we move now into the bulk of our text, the, the discussion about what's happened to Job. You see, after Job lost everything, his three friends, they showed up to comfort Job, but they ended up being miserable comforters to take Job's own words. And they spent 30 chapters accusing Job of having some sort of secret sin. And this was their line of thinking. God is just, correct. Jo God punishes evil, right again. God, uh, Job is being punished, obviously, because everything is falling apart. Ah, oh, you're on shaky ground. Therefore, Job must be evil and have some sort of secret sin. They were wrong all about it. And so Job's three friends... Uh, Eliphaz and Bildad and Elihu, they go round and round and round and round and round until finally the three friends, they give up and they're done trying to convince Job that he's got some sort of secret sin in his life. At that point, 
Young Buck shows up on the scene. We've been studying through his speeches for the last few weeks. Elihu. Elihu was the young guy on the scene, and he was there witnessing the whole conversation, the whole discussion between Job's friends and Job. And he thought that everybody had it wrong, and he was going to give everybody the what for. He was going to let Job's friends have it, and he was going to let Job have it. And he spent the last six chapters uh, pretty much sounding like Job's friends, but from a different perspective. And so there's Elihu. He's describing the majesty of God and telling Job where he went wrong. But as he's doing this, there's a storm that's building on the horizon. And Elihu is using the gathering storm as kind of like his own uh, you know, pyrotechnics or his own stage uh, sort of effects to, to, to make things, uh, I don't know, more interesting. And so as the lightning is flashing, the thunder is crashing, he's speaking about God's uh, amazing awesomeness. And then as the storm finally reaches this group of men and the bystanders that were listening to this debate go on, boy, God shows up out of the whirlwind. God begins to speak to Job and speak to Job's friends. And you guys remember what God said? He said, what are you guys doing? Who, who, who brings such arrogant words against my wisdom? Basically is what the Lord said. None of you guys get it. And that's what we talked about on Sunday as we covered chapter 38. We talked about the need to have a heavenly perspective, that that is what Job and his friends were missing. They were seeing things from their own carnal perspective and not from God's heavenly perspective. And so they missed it all together. And so God shows up on the scene and he begins to speak out of the whirlwind and speak to these guys, to Job really specifically. And he begins to kind of, bring Job into a place of surrender, into a place of submission. He begins to show Job that, Job, you aren't actually uh, on par to go toe to toe with me. Because remember, throughout Job's dilemma and throughout all of the debate, Job kind of had one complaint, God, where are you? Show up that I might plead my case, that you might vindicate me in front of everybody. And now God is calling Job out and saying, listen, Job, uh, I don't know if you should be calling me out. You're, you're really not at the level to call me out uh, the way that you have been. And so God begins to show Job uh, really his, his own weakness, his need to submit to the Lord, his need to, to trust in the Lord uh, as he kind of hammers Job with a series of 70-odd questions uh, about creation, what we looked at on Sunday. God goes into the creation of the, the earth. Job, where were you when I set the foundations of the earth? Uh, Job really couldn't answer that. Uh, I didn't see that, God. I, I wasn't around. Exactly. Job, where were you when I established the boundaries of the sea and land? Uh, I don't know, Lord. I, I wasn't there. You're getting it, Job. Where were you when I separated day from night? And he goes on and on to talk about the storms and the stars. And, and Job, where were you? And now... We'll pick up where we left off in chapter 38, in verse 39, where God continues on with this same line of questioning, but he moves from the inanimate, the, the, the rocks and the, the stars, to now the animate, the, the, the animal kingdom. How many of you guys remember Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom? Man, was that the greatest show or What? It was on PBS, and I used to love that show. It was way before Discovery or Animal Planet or any of those uh, network shows. And it would come on like once a week or once a month on PBS, and it was this solid like 45 minutes of just uninterrupted dive into the animal kingdom. I loved it as a kid. But it's going to kind of be like a little bit of Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom tonight as we look at God's creation as far as the animals are concerned, as God continues this line of questioning to Job to bring Job to a place of realizing, ah, oh, you know what, maybe I, I'm not as, as big and uh, powerful as I thought. Maybe I shouldn't have, uh, you know, called God into the courtroom. Uh, maybe I'm not equipped um, to, to have this discussion. So uh, verse 39 of chapter 38. Uh, Wilt thou hunt the prey for the lion or fill the appetite of the young lions? When they couch in their dens and abide in the covert to lie in wait, who provideth for the ravens his food? Uh, when his young ones cry unto God, they wander for lack of meat. And so God starts out uh, this series of describing several different animals 
he starts out with the lion and the raven, and he asks Job this question. Job, who, who hunts for the lion? Who taught the lion how to hunt? Uh, how is it that, that the lion is provided for? Who provides the gazelle for the lion? And, and how is it that he's able to catch that gazelle and eat it? Uh, who is it that provides for the raven's uh, food? And so God is beginning to now question Job. Job, who provides for the animals, the food, and the things that they need? And obviously, the answer to that question is God. And as we move through these animals, we're going to see Job is boy, he's going to be just uh, speechless. He's not even going to know what to say. But God says, can you provide the animals with food, Job? And speaking of providing the animals food, it's interesting. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was cleaning up my yard, and I was digging through the, the flower beds and pulling all the weeds, and I was making sure all the bark was just right. I like my yard to look nice and uh, you know, it's part of being a dad, I think. You got to have your lawn mowed and everything looking right. Anyways, I was pulling the weeds in the flower beds, and as I was adjusting the bark, I started noticing peanuts. I, I, I found a peanut. I'm like, oh, that's weird. I kind of chucked it out. I'm moving along. Peanut, peanut, peanut. I'm going, what is going on? Keep going down the line. Peanut, peanut. I moved to a different flower bed. Peanut, peanut. And I start looking around like somebody's pranking me. I'm like looking for the person who's going to be laughing. And then I realize... I've been seeing a gray squirrel running around. Somebody's been feeding the gray squirrel peanuts, and the gray squirrel has been digging and, and hiding his peanuts in my yard. So uh, we can provide for the animals, but not in the way that God is talking about. God says, how is it that all the wild animals uh, are provided for? And of course, again, the answer is God. God is their provider. But more importantly, and I think the point God is, is making, uh, an application that we can glean tonight, is that if God provides for the animals who are not created in his image, uh, don't you think that the Lord would provide for us who are made in his image, who are fearfully and wonderfully made, the Bible says? And, and I think that, that this is kind of the underlying theme also, outside of the correction, outside of the bringing Job into a place of submission, is God is reminding Job that he is in control and that he's got it. Uh, remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6? Uh, starting in verse 25 there. He said, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by talking, can add one cubit to his stature. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. So it's interesting, Jesus he, he told his disciples, he said, listen, all of those things that you worry about and fret over, uh, you know, what you're going to wear and, you know, what you're going to eat and what you're going to drink, don't worry about those things. I provide. Look at nature. Look at the way I provide for nature. And you're of much more value than nature. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And I think that's important for us to remember because in our day and age, we can get caught up in material things, can't we? In, in, in paying our bills, and boy, I need clothes or shoes or gas money or, or, or whatever. God knows your need. He will provide for you. We can be freed up to seek first the kingdom of God. Now, I'm not advocating for laziness uh, or, or any of that, but what I'm saying is, boy, God provides for the animals. We are so much more valuable than the animals. God will provide and take care of you uh, as well. And we're going to talk about this in Psalm 1 when we get there uh, on Sunday. How 
Uh, it's for his name's sake. Or maybe that's Psalm 23. We'll get there. I think that's Psalm 23, actually. We'll talk about it soon in Psalms. But that it's for his name's sake that he leads us beside still waters and green pastures. We belong to him. He's not just going to let us, you know, starve and, and fall apart. And, and again, I, I believe that this is, uh, again, part of God's argument to Job. Job, don't forget, as, as God kind of presents his case, I'm big enough to take care of you, Job. Uh, don't forget that. Chapter 39, verse 1. Knowest thou the time when the wild goats of the rock bringeth forth? Or canst thou mark when the hinds do calve? Canst thou number the months that they fulfill? Or knowest thou the time when they bringeth fruit? Or bringeth forth, pardon me. Uh, they bow themselves, they bring forth their young ones, they cast out their sorrows. Their young ones are in good liking, and they grow up with corn, and they go forth and they return not unto them. And so now God turns from the lion and the raven that he provides food for, and God says, look at the, the goat and the deer, or the mountain goat and the deer. And he, he begins to talk about the way that they give birth, their gestational period. And, and God says to Job, Job, do you know when these wild animals, these mountain goats and deer, do you know when they give birth? Do you know how that works? Do you know how they raise up their young uh, safely that, that they'll you know, leave home one day? How do the little ones know when it's safe to leave? And how do the mothers raise them up? And Job, do you know any of these things? And of course, Job didn't. But it's interesting that uh, you know, many commentators believe that the mountain goat that's being talked about right here is the Nubian ibex. And you can look this up. Boy, it's this little mountain goat with the big old horns that go back like that. And uh, it lives, even in this day and age, around uh, in Israel in different places. And uh, boy, I tell you what, these goats are crazy. They live on cliffs. And when I say cliff, I mean they live on cliffs. And these animals, it's like a goat. And he's walking around on a cliff. And you're like, how on earth? They find this little trail. And they just make their way up and down these cliffs to the top of this mesa. And you think, well, that's impressive. Then they have babies. Babies, little tiny goats on the top of this mesa. And when they're around a week old, one week, the mama goat shows them the way off the side of the cliff down to the bottom where they can get some food. And you should see these little babies. They still have their dried up umbilical cords hanging off their belly. And they are making their way off these cliffs. And so I can just imagine. I mean, Job had probably seen these crazy, amazing animals. And God's saying, Job, do you understand how this even takes place? How I've created them to do this? How this little baby goat knows when it's time to head down the hill and follow its mom? When it's time? You don't understand, Job. And uh, he, he uses this as, again, uh, a way to show Job that, man, he's just unaware uh, of uh, how things work. He's um, unequipped to debate God. Uh, and then he moves from the goat uh, to speaking about the wild donkey in verse 5 of chapter 39. And who hath set out the wild ass? Or who hath loosed the bands of the wild ass? Uh, whose house I have made the wilderness and the barren land his dwellings? He scorneth the multitude of the city, neither regardeth he the cry of the driver. The range of the mountains is his pasture, and he searcheth after every green thing. So after he talks about the lion and the raven and the mountain goat and the deer, now God brings up the wild donkey. And uh, he says, consider the wild donkey. Now, we don't have a lot of wild donkeys running around here. When I drove to Las Vegas with my grandfather, I remember we were going through some deserts, and there was wild donkeys all over the place. But Job is being told here by God, consider the wild donkey who just roams around in the barren wasteland, who hates the city and loves the remote area. Who, who taught the donkey to, to be that way? How is it that the donkey ekes out a living amongst this barren wasteland? Uh, and boy, if you've driven that road from here through LA to Las Vegas, it is barren. Let me tell you what, how do animals even survive out here? Uh, and God says, consider the donkey. How does this work, Job? Uh, can you tell me? And again, of course, Job cannot. These are all rhetorical questions that God obviously knows that Job can't answer because he's making the point. Uh, verse 9. How many of you guys have a King James Bible? Let me see by raise of hands. 
King James Bible, only a few of you are really going to enjoy this next verse. So verse 9, will the unicorn be willing to serve thee or abide by the crib? Canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow? Or will the harrow, or will he harrow the valleys after thee? Will thou trust him because his strength is great? Or will thou leave thy labor to him? Wilt thou believe him that he will bring home thy seed and gather it into the barn? And so unicorn, it's interesting. It's an ox. And so if you guys don't have uh, the, the King James, it probably says ox. But I love that. I don't know why it's translated unicorn. But that right there is one of the reasons I use the King James Version. It's awesome. It says unicorn. You can flip to your, your unbelieving friends and say, did you know that the unicorn was a biblical char- uh, character, biblical creature? Check it out. The unicorn's right there. Now, again, this is not the mythical creature that's the horse with the, the horn that eats butterflies and poops rainbows. Uh, this is uh, speaking of a wild ox, uh, a wild ox that, that is huge. And actually, they have uh, skeletal remains. There's like fossils of this uh, huge uh, Arak is what it's called. Uh, and it, it stands at the shoulder over six feet tall. And it's got these big old horns, kind of like a, it's kind of like a big giant uh, longhorn steer. Uh, but it was wild and it was ferocious and it was untamable. And God's saying to Job, look at this wild beast, this ox. You think you're going to tame this thing? You think you're going to hook it up to your farming equipment and get it to, to plow your fields? You think you're going to get this thing to, you know, help you harvest and bring the wheat into your barns? Uh, Not a chance, Job. And God's point is, Job, if you can't even uh, control this animal, if you can't tame this auroch, this wild ox, Job, what chance do you have to challenge me, God, the creator of all things? Job's starting to think, I'm sure, by now, and we'll see that he actually is. Verse 13. Gavest thou the goodly wings to the peacocks? Some of your uh, versions might say uh, heron or uh, stork. Uh, Or wings and feathers unto the ostrich, which leaveth her eggs in the earth and warmeth them in the dust, and forgetteth that the foot may crush them or that the wild beast may break them. She's hardened against her young ones as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without fear because God hath deprived her of wisdom. Neither hath he imparted to her understanding. What time she lifteth up herself on high, she scorneth the horse and his rider. And so God begins to now describe the stork and the ostrich. And, uh, you know, the ostrich is a bizarre creature, isn't it? Uh, It's this bird, this giant bird, and it has feathers. And that's what God says. Uh, Look at the stork. I gave the stork feathers and wings, and I gave the ostrich feathers and wings. Uh, There's a distinct difference. One can soar on the clouds, and the other one cannot. Uh, These gigantic birds that, you know, stand seven to eight feet tall. I did not realize ostriches could be eight feet tall. 300 pounds, uh, these birds. Uh, and What weird animals. And so they lay their eggs on the ground. And and that's what God is, is talking about, like the weird uh, kind of lack of knowledge and understanding that these animals have. It seems so bizarre. Why would you lay your egg on the ground where it's so, uh, you know, susceptible to being crushed or susceptible to, to predation? And actually, ostriches, they will lay their eggs in like a group nest with other ostriches. And sometimes they will forget which eggs are theirs and they'll sit on a different batch of eggs and they'll abandon their own eggs sometimes they'll go to lay an egg in a nest and it's full so they'll just lay it kind of out in the open and it ends up getting trampled and so it's interesting that god is saying you know that they don't make very good moms ostriches don't they're not getting cards on mother's day Uh, they they make terrible moms uh but there is this uh weird uh just bizarre thing about them where they don't have wisdom And, you know, that's interesting because that's what sets human beings apart from all animals. I mean, the ostrich sounds like it is exceptionally just dumb in some of these areas. Uh, But all animals were created without understanding. Animals were created without wisdom. They are different than human beings. And it always cracks me up, kind of in a sad way, to be honest, uh, when you see people so lost and so wanting to, to protect animals and 
you know, there's a whole, you know, entire movement to become vegan to protect animals and our animal friends. And it, it, some of the, the, like, I don't, I guess I could call it, it is propaganda. Some of the propaganda they put out, it is just hilarious. Like the most awkward people making up these songs about not calling each other pigs. Like imagine two middle-aged, just really uncool white people rapping a song like in a kid's sort of format. Uh, how not to call people pigs because pigs are offended. Don't call people dogs because dogs will be offended. You're like, oh man, that is so cringy. Uh, but they do these sort of things. And, and it's like, you know, uh, you know, people being bent out of shape and stop eating our brethren. Oh, who's eating our brethren? Uh, uh, the chicken is not my brethren. I'm sorry. Uh, the, 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 you know, the, the cow is not my brethren. Now, again, I'm not advocating for animal cruelty. We ought to be good stewards. And I think sometimes we can uh, walk the line the other way and be like, oh, we're not getting sucked into that liberal nonsense. And yeah, eat all the meat you can. Uh, but, you know, there, there's being a good steward also and take caring, uh, taking care of the things that God has placed in our care. Uh, but, you know, it is interesting to me. And as I studied through this and came across that, that verse that, you know, the ostrich is without understanding. All animals are without understanding. I know your dog is smart. I get that. But they don't have the same understanding uh, that we have. But uh, these interesting creatures, the ostrich, for all of their stupidity, they can run 40 miles an hour. That's what it says. They mount up and they get booking and they can run as fast as a horse. And in fact, do you know people race on top of ostriches? Jockeys get on ostriches and they race them around. And it actually kind of seems like a, a Midwestern uh, like version of like a redneck rodeo event. Uh, it, it's not something that is real serious, but people ride ostriches. Eh, interesting. So God points to the ostrich and says, look at the bizarre creature I made in the ostrich. Job, you get it? Nope, he certainly does not. Verse 19. Uh, Hast thou given the horse strength, Job? Hast thou clothed his neck with thunder? Can thou make him afraid as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostril is terrible. He poth in the valley and he rejoice in his strength. He goes on to meet the armed men and he mocks at fear. And he is not affrighted, neither turneth he the back from the sword. The quiver rattleth against him, the glittering spear and the shield. And he swallowed the ground with fierceness and rage. Neither believeth he that it is the sound of the trumpet. He saith among the trumpets, ha ha. And he smelleth the battle afar off and the thunder of the captains and the shouting. And so now the horse, describing a war horse. What about the war horse, Job? Uh, this amazing, powerful animal that's just, boy, ready for war. As it paws at the ground and hears the, the battle cry and takes off so fast. He's like eating up the ground and the, the riders' war weapons are clanking on there and who created this fierce beast? Job, do you understand that? Verse 26, uh, doth the hawk fly by thy wisdom and stretch her wings towards the south? Does the eagle mount up at thy command and make her nest on high? She dwelleth and abide on the rock, upon the crag of the rock and the strong place. From thence she seeketh the prey and her eyes behold afar off. Her young ones also suck up blood where there are uh, the slain. Uh, there she is. And so now uh, God begins to address Job concerning the eagle and the hawk and uh, these uh, majestic uh, creatures. And uh, God says, consider these animals. Uh, you know, how do they know to, to migrate annually, Job? How, how do they know, how do they have the instinct to build their nests on the cliff that their young would be safe and so that they could see the prey. How did they even know that the eagle could see that far to get the prey? Because it's God speaking, of course. But Job, do you understand all of these things? Do you understand the migration and the, the nesting habits? And uh, this word for uh, eagle or for uh, hawk is also in Hebrew a word that is used for vulture. So uh, just uh, fun fact, just side note, lots of people believe that this also is... Uh, a griffin vulture, you know, the classic vulture you see like in the cartoons with the little tuft around its neck and everything. Um, so, yeah, because of where it says that they drink blood uh, and that they're on the carcass. But eagles eat carcasses also. Uh, anyways, just, just so you know, um, you know, you can lock that away and I'll never use that information again. <laughs> uh, but there you have it. Uh, verse 40. 
So, moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall he that contend with the Almighty instruct him? He that reproveth God, let him answer. And so now God is kind of, he's taking a break for just a second and saying, All right, Job, are you going to contend with me? Uh, will the fault finder find fault with the creator? Uh, Job, tell me. Uh, respond to me, Job. Uh, I want to hear what you have to say. Uh, God is kind of calling Job out uh, on the carpet. And then Job answered the Lord. And he said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer yea twice, but I will proceed no further. And, and so now Job is face to face with the Lord and his uh, awesomeness and his uh, magnificence. And all he can do is put his hand over his mouth. He, he's just in awe. He has absolutely nothing to say, which is interesting because when Job was focusing on his situation, right, he couldn't stop talking. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. I mean, Job went on and on and on and on too. He called his friends windbags. His friends called him windbags, all rightfully so. They talked and they talked and they talked and they talked and they talked. Job had a lot to say when his eyes were fixed on his problems. But you notice now that, that, that his eyes are fixed on the truth and the glory of God, that all of a sudden Job is speechless. And he begins to rightly recognize his error. He says, I'm done talking. Uh, that's it. I, I, I'm done. And, and that's key for us as well. There's a lesson for us in that, that, that we would be still and know that he is God, that we would be those who take our eyes off of our circumstances and put them on the Lord. See, when we focus on our problems and our issues, and boy, we have lots to say. We have lots of complaints. We have lots of worries. Lots and lots and lots. But when we put our focus and attention on the Lord, boy, Job is just like, well, I blew it. I'm going to be quiet. But we can be still and know that he's God. Like when Peter stepped out of the boat into the storm, when he kept his eyes on the Lord, boy, he was doing great. But then he took his eyes off of the Lord and put them onto the storm. And what happened? He began to sink. And it's the same principle. It's the same idea. Uh, when Job's eyes were focused on a situation, Lots to say, but now when he sees the truth of God, boy, nothing. And, you know, we have lots of things going on in our lives. And, you know, as we were even praying earlier, it's so amazing, you know, how our perspective changes when we just come into the presence of the Lord. When we put our focus on him uh, and the things of this world, they grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The things that you're wrestling with, the things that you thought were so awesome, the areas where you feel like you're let down. All of those things, hopes and dreams, all the things that we think we need or the things we wish weren't going on, they all pale in comparison to just the presence and the glory of being in God's uh, presence. They all pale in comparison to being uh, in God's presence. And that's what Job is uh, recognizing here. He's just, he's blown back. He doesn't know what to do. He's in awe. And uh, Job is humbled but Job is not yet repentant. Uh, verse 6, Job, uh, let's see, uh, then answered the Lord, God says unto Job, out of the whirlwind, and said, gird up thy loins. This is exactly what he said to him the first time. We talked about that on Sunday. Uh, gird up thy loins like a man, and uh, I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. Wilt thou also disannul my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me, that thou mayest be righteous? Hast thou an arm like God, or canst thou thunder with a voice like him? Deck thyself now with majesty and excellency, and array thyself with glory and beauty. Canst abroad the rage of thy wrath, and behold every one that is proud and abase him? Look on every one that is proud, and bring him low, and tread down the wicked in their place. Hide them in the dust together, and bind their faces in secret. Then will I also confess unto thee that thine own right and hand can save thee. And so God says, uh, listen, he continues out of the whirlwind. He continues to speak to Job out of his difficulties. But God says, Job, are you going to correct me so that you're the righteous one and I'm the one who's in error. Basically what God is saying to Job is, Job, you think we should switch places? Do you want to be the one who's in charge? Do you want to judge the wicked? Do you want to set things right? Uh, Job, uh, are you strong like me? That's when it says, do you have the arm? The arm speaks of strength. Uh, do you have a voice like thunder? 
Job, are you uh, majestic and excellent and beautiful and powerful uh, like me? Uh, remember, Job questioned why God did not put the wicked in their place. And, and God's saying, go for it, Job. Maybe we should uh, switch places. If you could have done these things, really, you would have been able to save yourself. Job, the day that you save yourself is the day I'll confess, all right, you're the guy. But you couldn't save yourself, right, Job? And, and so God is, is calling Job out on the carpet. Do you think that we should switch places? And I wonder if some of this is just like, boom, Job is like, whoa, I didn't realize uh, like how disrespectful or how prideful I was being towards the Lord in all of these, uh, you know, kind of accusations towards God. And so uh, God says to Job, you, you want to give a, a, a crack at this? All right, well, let's uh, introduce a couple more creatures and if you can subdue them, then maybe we'll, we'll talk about that. And so um, we've talked about the lion, the, the raven, and the ostrich, and the mountain goats, and deer, and wild donkeys, and the unicorns, and, and war horses, and, and all the rest. And now we look at two final creatures. Much more detail goes into the description of these two creatures, uh, the behemoth and the leviathan. Uh, and, and there's some debate about their identity, and you're going to see why as we look into this. Boy, it's not exactly clear what animals these are, but I want us to understand before we get into this, these are real creatures. They absolutely existed. They're not mythical creatures. They're not allegories that represent something else. God is speaking clearly about the things that he created. Look at this that I've created. Look at that that I've created. Uh, he, he's, he's telling Job, look at the things I've made and then you tell me. And so the first thing that we're going to look at here uh, is the behemoth uh, in verse 15 of chapter 40. Now behold, the behemoth, which kind of means like super beast, uh, which I made with thee. He eats grass like an ox. Lo, now his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. That's kind of an interesting superpower. <laughs> ah, I'm strong in my navel. Watch out. This animal is strong in his navel. He moves his tail like a cedar, and the sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. Surely the mountains bring uh, him forth food, where all the beasts of the field play. And he lieth under the shady trees in the cover of the reed and ferns. Uh, the shady trees cover him. With their shadow and the willows of the brook compass him about. Behold, he drinketh up a river and hasteth not. He trusteth that he can draw up Jordan into his mouth, and he taketh it with his eyes, his nose pierced through snares. And so, boy, there's this description of this creature that God created, this massive, powerful animal uh, who is an herbivore, whose power is in his midsection, and he's got this tail like a cedar, and his thighs are strung. His bones are like beams of iron, and his ribs are like bronze, and no one can take him down with a sword. Uh, only God can take this, man, this uh, beast down. His food comes from the mountains. Uh, it flows down the river. He's, he's not worried about the currents of the river. Uh, they don't bother him. Uh, he likes the shade. Nothing can take him down. The idea that any human could capture him it, it is laughable. Uh, but God can control this beast, uh, one of the most powerful of God's creation. And you say, boy, what is this animal? And there's lots of ideas, lots of people put in their two cents. They say, well, obviously this is an elephant. And you say, I guess I can, you know, an elephant's an herbivore and it's big. And, and they say, well, you know, it's kind of reversed. It's not a, a tail like a tree trunk. It's the nose. Like, that's kind of something, that's pretty important to get those two things confused, don't you think? The tail and the nose, they're in two different places. So, uh, a lot of people uh, would say, oh, it's a water buffalo. I say, I don't get water buffalo out of that description. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, rhinoceros, some people say. Uh, I, I guess it could be a rhinoceros. Uh, people say hippopotamus. Hippopotamus is probably the most agreed upon, oh, this is the description of a hippo. Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, a hippo kind of fits all of those categories. It's an herbivore. Uh, its strength is in its midsection. It's got big, strong thighs, strong bones and beams. I mean, it was a fearful creature. You know that there are more deaths caused by hippos in Africa than there are by lions in Africa. It's pretty crazy. Uh, hippos are dangerous animals. Uh, their food, it comes down from the mountains. So they say, oh, you know, their food is floating down the river and, and they eat it. They're not afraid of the currents. Uh, you know, nothing can take them down. 
uh, and I say I guess, uh, the, the tail like a cedar, though. Have you seen a hippo tail? It's like that big. And, and, and the people who are just like, and people argue about this stuff. They're adamant. Oh, it's a hippo. And they say, well, you know, it's like a, a, a cedar branch uh, flickering in the wind. And I say, oh, I, I guess whatever you have to do to kind of justify that cause, there are those who say it's a, it could be a dinosaur. Very well uh, could be. Uh, but the point is, God is saying this giant, powerful creature, if you can't stand before it, how do you expect to stand before me, Job, uh, with the, the, the behemoth? So uh, what is the behemoth? I'll let you make that decision. The Bible doesn't actually tell us definitively. Uh, I have my doubts even whether or not it is the hippo. Uh, and then God goes on to talk about the Leviathan, even more crazy a description of this animal. Canst thou draw out the Leviathan with a hook or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Canst thou put a hook into his nose or bore his jaw through with a thorn? Will he make any supplication unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? Will he make a covenant with thee? Wilt thou take him for a servant forever? Wilt thou play with him as with a bird or wilt thou bind him for thy maidens? Shall the companions make a banquet of him? Shall they part him among the merchants? Canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons or his head with fishing spears? Lay thine hand upon him. Remember the battle and do no more. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? Who hath prevented me that I should repay him? Whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. I will not conceal his parts, nor his power, nor his comely proportion. Who can discover the face of his garment? Or who can come to him with his double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible round about. It's probably one of my favorite descriptions of a mouth, the doors of your face. <laughs> the doors of his face. Let me open the doors of my face so I can take a bite of this pizza. I'm going to start saying that. I'll see if it catches on. But who can open the door of his face? His teeth are terrible round about. His scales are his pride, shut up together as with a close seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another and they stick together that they cannot be sundered. By his kneesings a light doth shine and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go the burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils go smoke as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindles coals and a flame goeth out of his mouth. And so uh, we begin to get this description of this other creature, this Leviathan. And uh, this is the longest description out of any of the other animals, really any animal in the Bible. And uh, God speaks and describes of this animal as untamable and powerful. Uh, this is a beast you're not going to catch with fishing gear. This is a beast that you're not going to hunt. Uh, this beast, God says, he belongs to me. He obeys me. Uh, don't disturb him. If you do, you're going to be sorry. Uh, you can't stand before him. He's fierce. He has big, scary teeth. Uh, his scales are like an impenetrable shield. And this is where it gets crazy. Right, uh, you, I can imagine this beast with scales and all the rest and the teeth, but now out of his mouth is burning lamps, sparks of fire, nostrils of smoke like a cauldron. His breath is coals of fire. His flames out of his mouth. You say, wait a second, what? That sounds an awful lot like a fire breather to me. I don't know about you guys. Uh, and you say, man, there's no way that anything could breathe fire. That's impossible. And lots of people believe that, you know, uh, the, uh, the idea of the dragon came from the book of Job and this description of the Leviathan. Now, I'm not saying that this is a dragon. I, I'm not saying that at, at all. But, uh, you know, it is a, an interesting uh, thing how it describes this fire-breathing uh, animal. And, you know, one interesting creature in the animal kingdom is the bombardier beetle. And this little bombardier beetle it has two compartments in its little rear end where there are two different chemical compounds. And when it's threatened, it, it juices these little compounds together and shoots this stream out of his little rear end that is boiling like acid. And, and so, you know, a lot of people say, oh, the scientists say there's actually an explosion that takes place that heats this acid up super hot. 
it's not a far reach to say that an animal couldn't have one time have had, you know, different components that mixed and made fire. And I, I don't know, it, it, it's possible. Read the description and tell me that it doesn't sound like it is uh, an animal that breathes uh, fire. Now, most people would say that this is a crocodile, uh, a lot of people. And, and, and so I say, well, what about the, 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 the fire part? And they say, well, that's when, you know, uh, a crocodile comes out of the water, and, you know, and the vapor, it, it hits the sunlight right, and it looks like fire. Wah, wah, wah. To me, I'm like, that is a lame description of what's going on there, folks. Uh, but uh, again, you be the judge. Uh, it kind of seems like a, a fire breather uh, to me. Again, I'm not saying it's a dragon. I'm just saying it's a remarkable description of this thing. Uh, verse 22. In his neck remains strength, and sorrow is turned into joy before him. Yikes. The flakes of his flesh are joined together. They are firm in themselves. They cannot be moved. His heart is as firm as a stone, yea, as hard as a piece of uh, nether millstone. And when he raised himself up, the mighty are afraid. By reason of breakings, they purify themselves. The sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold, the spear, the dart, nor the habergeon. He esteemed iron as straw and brass as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. Sling stones are turned with him into stubble. Darts are counted as stubble. He laughs at the shaking of a spear. Sharp stones are under him. He spreads sharp pointed things upon the mire. He makes the deep to boil like a pot. He makes the sea like a pot of ointment. He maketh the path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be hoary. Upon earth there is not, like, uh, not his like who is made without fear. He beholdeth all things. He's the king over the children uh, of pride. So he talks about this animal, it's tough all over, his flesh cannot be moved, his heart's like a rock, a sword or a spear or an arrow can't penetrate him, uh, iron is like straw, brass like rotten wood, even his underbelly, like what would normally be the, the most vulnerable part of any animal, uh, it, it, it's hard, it's like broken pottery, it's practically invincible, this animal. Uh, when he moves through the water, it, he makes the water to, to look like it's boiling up, like uh, an apothecary, he's mixing up uh, different, uh, you know, ointments or whatever. Uh, he leaves a, a shine streak behind him, a wake, and then the wake, it white caps, like, uh, looks like white hair or hoary hair. Nothing on earth can stand against it. Uh, so Leviathan I is a, a, a fierce animal. Uh, but again, is it a crocodile? I mean, I can see, like, the fierce teeth and the scales and, you know, moving through the water quickly. You're like, oh, definitely, there's some glimpses of crocodiles in there but I've never seen a fire-breathing crocodile, and I'm not so sure I, I uh, am on board with the artsy description. There's the guy's just being artsy. I understand that. I mean, he could. I don't want to take that away from him. But the point that I want to make is I don't know why we feel like we have to explain away everything that is uh, unexplainable in the Bible. We have this tendency as human beings to say, well, we need to explain every single little thing. And if I can't understand it, then boy, I'm just not satisfied. And that's what it, this is born out of. It's got to be a crocodile. It's got to be him. Why can't we just say, wow, that's amazing. I don't know what it is, but God is good. Because that's the whole point is God is amazing and awesome and, and, and huge. And that's the point he's making to Job. Uh, I don't know why we have to explain the unexplainable. Uh, this transfers over into lots of other areas in the Bible, uh, be careful with that uh, as Christians. Uh, God gave us a brain. He's called us to, to reason. He's called us to, you know, figure stuff out. Uh, but there's a line to that. And sometimes I think that we can cross that line and it gets unfruitful. And so, uh, again, hippo, could be. Dinosaur, maybe. Crocodile, uh, might be. Uh, sea creature, definitely possible. I'll let you uh, determine that. The point is, Job, can you subdue these beasts? Of course not. And if you can't subdue these beasts, then how do you expect to subdue me? And now Job is starting to see clearly the pecking order that, that God is getting at. He's starting to pick up what God is laying down. Verse 1 of chapter 42, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Wherefore have I uttered that I understood not, things too wonderful for me, which I knew not, 
Hear, I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself, and I repent in dust and in ashes. So now Job answers the Lord, and he's completely overwhelmed by the greatness of the creator and his creation. And he's sensing now his own inadequacy. He's sensing his own need for the Lord. Job's perspective is changing, and he recognizes his own foolishness. He recognizes God's sovereignty, that God has created everything, that God is in control of everything. And again, I wonder if Job isn't having this revelation now, like, oh man, that was bad. I shouldn't have done that. And as he recognizes the errors of his ways, as he understands that he was wrong and didn't have a clue, now he begins to turn and, and repent from his sin. But that's the way that it always is. We think we understand what's going on in our lives, and, and, and therefore we question God. But we say, well, look at this, and why would this be going on? And if I had it my way, things would be completely different. And, and we can get angry, or we can get sad, or we can get depressed, or... The other side of that coin is we can trust the Lord and we can walk in joy and we can walk in peace. Uh, you know, uh, Job here is going to be a good example for us. Uh, but Job here is humbled. Uh, Job was remorseful before. Uh, when we heard from Job just a minute, Job, and he, he put his hand over his mouth, he's like, oh man, uh, I'm feeling remorseful. I'm feeling like I'm inadequate. Now Job has gone from remorse to repentance. And again, we've talked about the difference in those two things. Uh, remorse is feeling bad about your sin. Remorse is feeling, oh man, I, I got caught or I'm dealing with consequences. That's not good. Uh, repentance is more than just feeling bad. Repentance means to turn from your sin. Remorse is a good thing. Remorse causes us to repent oftentimes. Uh, but repentance is actually turning from your sin. Job is saying, man, Lord, I spoke to you in a way that I shouldn't have, and I'm turning from that. I repent from that. Uh, he was humbled, and now he's uh, feeling repentance, uh, which is a good thing. Now, to be clear, Job is not repenting of the sin that his friends accused him of. Right? The Bible is clear on that. Job, you know, there, God called him a, a righteous man. Uh, God said that he was, you know, a, a, above the board, that he was a man of integrity, not that he was sinless, but that he was an upright and just man. Uh, the Bible teaches us that, you know, Job, he didn't sin in all the things that he said to the Lord. Uh, as far as the original accusation, Job never cursed God. Job never washed his hands of God. Job was never angry with God. Job never abandoned God. Job did question God, and that's what God is setting him straight on. And that is what he's repenting for. God, I should have never come at you uh, that way. I should have never... Um, you know, tried to, to, to reason with you or uh, to call you out on the carpet. Uh, that was wrong, and, and I'm repenting. I'm, I'm seeing your bigness. I'm seeing your greatness, uh, Lord, and I repent from that sin. Verse 7, And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for you have not spoken of me, the thing that is right as my servant Job hath. Therefore, take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you. For him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, and that you have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Naamathite went and did according as the Lord commanded them, the Lord also accepted Job. Now, get this. Isn't this an awesome turn of events? So, so God rebukes Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar and says, listen, you guys represented me wrongly. You, you painted a picture of me like I was uh, this God of cause and effect, that I could be manipulated by the works of men, that if, if you were good, then I would just automatically bless you, and if you were bad, then I would automatically curse you. Uh, I can't be manipulated that way. God was mad, and he said, uh, listen, uh, you guys are going to go now to Job. You're going to offer sacrifices to me before him, and he's going to pray for you. He's going to be the mediator. Now, how ironic is that? Job's friends have spent so much time telling Job that he was the sinner, and now God says, no, you guys are wrong. 
I want you to go and offer sacrifices because you were the sinner. And Job, the one you accused of being wrong, is going to be the mediator because he was right. That is awesome. That's so great. Job here, vindication for him before his friends, honor for him before his uh, friends. Uh, that's a pretty good day uh, for Job here as the Lord has uh, these three friends do this. Verse 10, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Uh, also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been of his acquaintance before. And they did eat bread with him in his house and they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Uh, every man also gave him a piece of money and everyone an earring of gold. So the Lord blessed the later end of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and 1,000 yoke of oxen and 1,000 she-asses. And he had also seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first Jemima and the name of the second Tezeah and the name of the third uh, Karen Hapuk and all the land where no woman found so fair as the daughters of Job. And their father gave them an inheritance among their brethren. And after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. So Job died being old and full of days. So Job's free three friends, who had never once even prayed for him, think about that. Uh, they were at a loss to what to do for poor Job, so they just argued with him. Uh, you know, when we first started the book of Job, we looked at these three friends as an example of how not to be a friend. Don't be friends like Job's friends who came and they railed with accusations and they, 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 were, they were tough on Job. Uh, they should have done the opposite. Uh, there's a lesson for, for us in there. Uh, and, and we've talked about this, that, you know, Weep with those who are weeping. When your friends are going through things, sometimes we don't have to have all the answers. We don't have to have all of the advice. We can just cry with them and pray for them. Better yet, pray with them. Uh, super key thing. But, but these three friends never once had prayed for, for Job. And now Job, he, uh, he prays for and forgives these guys. That's so huge. Uh, it's interesting. It's been said that, that repentance paved the way for his forgiveness and his forgiveness paved the way for him to forgive his friends. And, and that's so true. And we've talked about that so often th that we're called to forgive others according to Ephesians 4.32, not because people are worthy of our forgiveness, but because God has forgiven us. Uh, we are to walk in forgiveness because God has forgiven us. So often when we forgive people, there's strings attached. You know, uh, you know I'm not going to forgive them because they're not sorry enough. I'm not, let me ask you this. Were you sorry enough when God forgave you? Did you deserve to be forgiven by the Lord? We didn't. And that's why the Lord says, hey, forgive because you're forgiven. And here's the, the wonderful thing about that is when we forgive, boy, there's blessing in it. There's freedom in it. We feel like, boy, we're going to let them have it by not forgiving them, and they're just going to feel it. They just go along with their lives. You're the one who's stewing in bitterness and, and sadness, but you forgive and say, you know what? I forgive. And guess what? There's a freedom that comes. Now, that doesn't mean that person has full access to your life. We've talked about this. Uh, doesn't mean all things are restored. God can do that work, but restoration and forgiveness are two different things. Forgiveness is something we can do, and there's freedom found in it. And Job here, boy, he finds uh, and, and forgives uh, for uh, his friends, and he prays uh, for them. And then we see that Job ends up with a double blessing, twice as much. That's pretty awesome, that in the end, his end was better than it was in the beginning. Twice as many uh, sheep and camels and, and, and donkeys, uh, God restored uh, Job. Uh, but you notice it, that Job had 10 kids. And you're like, wait a second. If he's getting double portion, shouldn't he have 20 kids? Well, Job actually did have 20 kids. Job had 10 kids with the Lord and 10 kids on earth with him. So pretty sweet deal to, to think about that. Um, but Job, boy, he lived 140 years. His kids were restored to him. Uh, you saw that he had... Uh, 
uh, a famous daughter was born unto him. Uh, there, uh, his firstborn daughter, her name was Jemima. She went on to start a, a, a maple syrup empire. <laughs> you were thinking it too. Come on, be honest when I said Jemima. Uh, but Job, you know, he, he goes on to live happily ever after. And, and here's the thing as we close up the book of Job. You know, it was a, a, a difficult story to read through because, boy, there's so much of, of the story where we're just, we're kind of in it with Job. We're in the sorrow and we're in the suffering and we're in the why uh, with Job. But we can be encouraged in that the, the Lord knew the end from the beginning for Job. He knew how things were going to turn out for Job. Uh, all of Job's fretting, all of Job's questioning, all of Job's fear, it didn't add one second to his life. It didn't add one inch to his stature. It didn't change his situation whatsoever. Because God writes our last chapter. God gets the final say. And it encourages me. Because I remember, that's right, God. You've got things under control. It, it reminds me that God loves me. That God has a plan for me. That God is going to see me through. And, and we don't have to worry. I, I tell myself this all the time. Worrying doesn't change anything. I'm always so frustrated with myself when, you know, there's uh, on the horizon some potential bad news or things look like they're going bad or things have gone bad. And I worry and I worry and I worry and I worry and then things work out. And I'm like, why did I spend all that time worrying? Next time I'm not going to worry. And then next time comes around and guess what happens? I worry. But this reminds me that we don't have to. It, it frees me up. That we can just trust the Lord when we don't understand. It frees me up to thank the Lord because I know that he's going to work things together for good. And it frees me up to worship the Lord no matter what my circumstances are. We remember that God knows the end. He's going to see us through. That it frees us up. Even in the midst of the difficulties, we can be free to rejoice. And that's what the Bible tells us, to rejoice. And even in difficulties. Job never did get an explanation. The Lord never told him what was going on. We, from the very beginning, knew exactly what was going on. That Job was being used to silence Satan. Job never got that information. I'm sure he knows now. He's in heaven. But he didn't know this side of heaven. But what Job received was far greater than his treasures physically, far greater than his relationships with his kids, far greater than any explanation that he could have ever gotten. What Job received was a, a deeper faith and a deeper understanding of God a deeper reverence for his maker, a deeper trust, and really a greater joy. And that's what the Lord would have for us in our trials and difficulties. And I'm not saying that every single trial ends with a double portion and blessing for everybody. That, you know, boy, you know what? Your breakthrough is just right around the corner and hang in there. And I am telling you to hang in there. And I am telling you that someday things will be amazing. There's no guarantee it'll be in this world. But we do have a promise for the next one. And so in the meantime, in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of strife, in the midst of questions and uncertainty, and be freed up to worship the Lord. Be freed up to trust the Lord. Have your faith increased. Man, we don't have to fret. We don't have to fear. We can just simply believe. Uh, and boy, those words, boy, let them encourage you when things seem dark. Because when we're in the midst of the storm, boy, that's much easier said than done, isn't it? But suddenly, the book of Job becomes, boy, not a book of sorrows, but a book of encouragement. And uh, I pray that, boy, we take some good stuff away from this book. And that's it. That's the end of the book of Job. Man, it was fun. Uh, and we'll be kicking off Psalms on Sunday. So uh, that's it. So Lord, thank you again so much for your word. And thank you so much for Job and for the lessons that you taught us uh, through his life. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to, to keep our, our eyes fixed on our Savior, on our God, on our Lord, on our shepherd, and not on our circumstances and not on our situation. Lord, I pray that even in the midst of difficulty and trial, Lord, that we would remember that you're good and that you've got it and that you know the end and that you're writing the last chapter and that he who began a good work in us is faithful to complete that work. Lord, help us to trust you more and more, knowing that even in the difficulty, Lord, you're building into us something that is so valuable. Lord, I pray, God, that we would, again, trust you more and more, that we'd be freed up and filled with joy, even in the midst of difficulty. 
And again, Lord, thank you for this time we've had in Job. Uh, I pray, Lord, that we would take uh, your word and hide it in our hearts. And Lord, that it would be an encouragement to us when we, when we need it. Uh, Lord, we love you. We thank you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good job. That was like four and a half chapters. You guys rocked it tonight.